Sara, you're muted. Sorry about that. Okay, can you hear me now? Great. So thanks for the wonderful introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, so uh, as you mentioned, I'm Sarah. I'm currently a postdoc in David Williams Group at the University of Rochester. Um, so this picture, unfortunately, it's not Rochester. It's actually Lake Union in Seattle, Washington. Seattle's where I did the work I'll discuss today and the Lab of J Knights who actually took this picture. And it's a good picture because it demonstrates what I'll be talking about today. That's a color vision circuit used not for perceiving the colors of the sunset, but for using the colors to tell the time of day. The neuron encoding this potential chromatic circadian cue is called the intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cell, or IPRGC, which sets the circadian clock by carrying visual information from the retina to the SCN. Now IPRGCs are interesting because they're both ganglion cells and photoreceptors. Like a photoreceptor, the IPRGCs have a photopigment called melanopsin, which absorbs photons of light. And like a ganglion cell, IPRGCs also receive input from traditional cone photoreceptor pathways. And in the primate retina, IPRGCs are cone opponent, and they respond to increments in LM cone contrast and decrements in S cone contrast. Now the IPRGCs, they're involved in this kind of constantly growing list of non-image forming visual functions. But for this talk, I'll focus on the role of the spectral potency in the IPRGC's best known function, circadian photoentrainment, which is the process of aligning our internal circadian rhythms with the external day-night cycle. Now for this purpose, there are two main visual cues an IPRGC could be encoding. So as the sun rises and sets, the irradiance or the total amount of light changes. However, the, spectral, the average spectral distribution of the sky also changes throughout the day with these peaks in spectral contrast at sunrise and sunset. Now, while considerable progress has been made in investigating how melanopsin could be encoding a radiance, much less is known about the potential role of cone opponent inputs in encoding chromatic circadian cues. And one reason for this is that the underlying circuitry for the LM versus S cone opponency is not well understood. While DB6 diffuse on bipolar cells appear to be a source of the LM on response, the source of the S off response had not been identified. One long standing hypothesis though, was that the S off response is mediated by the S on pathway through inhibitory input from an undiscovered S cone amacrine cell. There are two main reasons why no one had found this amacrine cell before. First, the mammalian retina contains anywhere from 40 to over 60 different types of amacrine cell, which makes selective identification of any one undiscovered type a big challenge. And these difficulties are compounded in the primate retina, which lacks all the sophisticated genetic and molecular tools available in other animal models. Moreover, the rarity of S cones makes their circuitry difficult to study. And as a result, little is known about the diversity of pathways carrying S cone signals. So to find this amacrine cell, we turn to serial electron microscopy, where the rarity of S cones actually becomes an advantage. The limited number of neurons receiving significant S cone input limits the complexity that you typically encounter in connectomics and make, made sparse reconstruction a manageable approach for testing the predictions of our S-cone circuit hypothesis. So using a serial block face scanning electron microscope, we sliced horizontally through this block of macaque macular retina every 90 nanometers, taking a high resolution EM image of each section. The resulting data set of nearly 2000 images allows us to trace neurons through the sections and reconstruct their morphology in 3D. So for example, this video traces an on and off major bipolar cell from the major dendrite to the synapses within the comb pedicle. So to find this S cone amacrine cell, I needed to be able to look at a section of inner retina such as this one and reliably identify the rare S on bipolar cells and then an even rarer unknown postsynaptic amacrine cell. So this all depended on my ability to confidently identify the S cone circuits. So I'll start by taking you through the S cone identification process. So as a guide, I used the best studied S cone circuit in the primate retina, which is the small bistratified ganglion cell circuit. First, we identify potential S cones by their smaller sizes. However, you can see here, there is a lot of variability with this measurement. So to confirm cone type, we needed to reconstruct their postsynaptic circuitry. Now the primate retina contains two types of horizontal cell, 
The H2s preferentially contact S cones, while the H1s avoid S cones entirely. We reconstructed both and found that each S cone was extensively innervated by the H2, but not the H1 horizontal cells. Then we confirm cone type by reconstructing the on bipolar cell contacts. The LM cones are densely innervated by a single on midget bipolar cell shown here in green, while the S, while the S cones contact two to three S on bipolar cells. The S on bipolar cell branches have, these, have this distinctive ultrastructure, which you can distinguish from the on, LM on midget bipolar cell dendrites. So in that way, we identified eight S cones and 14 S on bipolar cells. Here, you're just seeing the branches of each S on bipolar cell in the outer retina, where they contact the cone pedicles. So finally, we, re we completed the circuit by confirming that S on bipolar cells do indeed contact small bistratified ganglion cells, one shown here in purple. And for the sake of completeness, we also reconstructed several of the presynaptic off diffuse bipolar cells as well. Uh, one example shown here in orange. Each small bistratified ganglion cell served as kind of like a bridge within the inner retina, which allowed us to identify 25 additional S on bipolar cell terminals. What you're seeing here in this figure is just the axon terminals of the S on bipolar cells, where they contact and synapse on amacron cells and ganglion cells. I'll display S on bipolar cells like this a few more times throughout the talk just to simplify the reconstructions. So then we also reconstructed both the M1 and the M2 IPRGCs the two major subtypes reported in the primate retina. The M1s and the M2s were distinguished by their stratification at the innermost and outermost layers of the inner retina. And for this work, I'll focus on the M1 IPRGCs that had somas in the ganglion cell layer and dendrites stratifying primarily the off layer. Uh, one disclaimer, our volume's not entirely flat. There's a slight curve as we come off the foveal slope. So you might notice in later reconstructions, Sometimes the long dendrites won't appear perfectly monostratified. So the IPRGC dendrites were sparsely branching and their dendritic fields extended beyond the edges of our 200 by 200 micron volume. And these dendritic fields of the reconstructed IPRGCs compared very well to cell fills of IPRGCs in the electrophysiology experiments I'll discuss later on. So our reconstructions of the established S-cone circuitry and the IPRGCs gave us the necessary infrastructure to effectively search for the source of the S-off response. So this is this image I showed you before. And now we can know that this here in blue is an S-on bipolar cell. The next step to identify a candidate S-cone amacron cells, I looked for neurons postsynaptic to the Riven synapses within the S-on bipolar cell terminals. You can see the ribbons right here. And then there's also a membrane density on the postsynaptic cell. These two features were what I used to identify amacron cells receiving excitatory glutamatergic input from the S on bipolar cells. Now there's a logistical challenge that S cone amacron cells need to solve. As the S on bipolar cell output is here, closest to the ganglion cell layer, while the M1 IPRGC dendrites are here, right next to the inner nuclear layer. One solution for this is presented by the S cone amacron cell that Whaley identified in ground squirrel. Much like an A2 amacron cell, the cell creates an S off pathway by receiving S on bipolar cell input here and then inhibiting neurons in the off layer here. However, this cell wasn't reported to contact IPRGCs. So while it let us know that S cone exclusive amacron cells are possible, we still weren't sure exactly how the S cone signal signals were going to reach the IPRGCs or what the amacron cell might look like. So at first, I just looked for any amacron cell receiving S on bipolar cell input. And to give you a sense of the diversity of the amacron cells, I'll show you some of the cells I found colored by their stratification within the inner retina. So these all received some degree of S on bipolar cell input, but none of them contacted nearby IPRGC dendrites. Oh, and by the way, the scale bars are all 10 microns here. So here's some that looked promising. They stratified with the S on bipolar cells, but then they never ended up receiving significant S on bipolar cell input. So then I started reconstructing amacron cells presynaptic to the M1 IPRGCs. Um, most never contacted S on bipolar cells or even reached the on layer. 
and many of them just travel through the entire volume looking like this. And so especially after reconstructing so many of these, I was starting to lose, kind of lose hope that I was ever gonna find this s cone amacrine cell in our tiny little, or in our relatively small volume. But this image that I keep showing is where I finally found the cell I was looking for. And it immediately stood out because there were three ribbon synapses just within this one section. So here's the one I pointed out before. There's a second one right here. And then a third one's here, which is here on this larger image. And here's our reconstruction of that amacrine cell. And you can see that this branch is perfectly aligned with the S-on bipolar cell terminal. Now, to our surprise, this amacrine cell wasn't just selective for S-on bipolar cell input. That could have been sufficient for the S-off response. The cell, in fact, received excitatory input exclusively from S-on bipolar cells. Note the edge of the volumes right here, so it's not a complete reconstruction. In the end, we had a population of four amacrine cells exclusively contacting the S-on bipolar cells. Their somas were displaced to the ganglion cell layers and their the ganglion cell layer, and their dendritic fields covered the S-on bipolar cell terminal mosaic, each collecting input from over seven S-on bipolar cells. And the N-retina s conamacrine cell dendrites co-stratified narrowly with the S-on bipolar cell terminals. However, some of them had this kind of unconventional form of bistratification, with some branches going up into the ganglion cell layer. Now, what was really cool about this was that these dendrites were providing synaptic input to an M1 IPRGC. Moreover, these small branches extended from the IPRGC soma and primary dendrites to receive additional input from the s cone amacrine cell. So here's what those synapses look like. The conventional synapses are identified by a cloud of vesicles on the presynaptic neuron and then a membrane density on the postsynaptic neuron. This one was from the inner retina right here, as was this one. This one was located at the end of one of these little branches within the ganglion cell layer. And this one was located onto the soma itself. So here's that IM1 IPRGC again with the locations of s cone amacrine cell input highlighted in green. You can see here how the s cone amacrine cell solves that logistical challenge I mentioned earlier, where the IPRGC dendrites stratify about as far away from the s on bipolar cell output as possible. So the s cone amacrine cell synapse is on the IPRGC as it passes through sublamina 5 and even travels into the ganglion cell layer to make additional synapses. This concentration of s cone inhibition near the action potential initiation site is ideally placed to provide some modulatory control over the synaptic inputs that the IPRGC receives throughout its dendritic field. And while this seems kind of odd, it's not actually not the first time IPRGCs have been reported to break the normal stratification rules of the retina, nor was it the first time that amacrine cell processes were reported in the ganglion cell layer. Anita Hendrickson's group reported GABA immune reactivity in the ganglion cell layer and nerve fiber layer, and even GABAergic inhibition on ganglion cell somas. Now, while we don't know the transmitter that the s cone amacrine cell uses yet, GABA is a good educated guess, as it's most common for medium field amacrine cells. And we found something similar in our second M2 IPRGC, which received input from a different s cone amacrine cell. In addition to the primary dendrites of the IPRGC, you can also see these small branches near the soma, similar to the other M1 IPRGC. And here you can see the same branch receiving input from an s cone amacrine cell. Now, I like to show kind of the, the raw data, so I'm gonna show you a video tracking this branch and I'll play it a few times. Uh, so first, I want you to just focus on this M1 IPRGC branch in green. It comes in from the top left, it splits, and then ends. So next, if you look in red at this s cone amacrine cell, you can see the M1 IPRGC branches end abruptly right after receiving synaptic input from the s cone amacrine cell. So there's one synapse, and another one's gonna be right up here. So if you finally track the s cone amacrine cell down to this corner, you can see it receiving input from this s on bipolar cell terminal in blue. And in case that was too much serialium, I'll just show a quick summary figure. Uh, you can see the s cone amacrine cell input to the M1 IPRGC dendrite here. And after that synapse, the IPRGC process just ended abruptly. And then you can see the s on bipolar cell input to the s cone amacrine cell here. 
Now here's our current network of S-Cone input to the M1 IPRGCs. It's likely an underestimate at both levels as we only included the M1 IPRGCs with somas within our EM volume. And some of the S-Cone amacrine cell branches ran off the volume's edges. Now we suspect the circuit could be quite conserved as neurons resembling the S-Cone amacrine cells that we reconstructed have been identified in several mammalian species. So Helga Kolb had a similar amacrine cell called the A12 amacrine cell, which she identified in human, ground squirrel, and cat. Mice have a similar cell that's called the MAS5, identified by Mueller and colleagues. And like our s cone amacrine cell, each of these had a soma displaced to the ganglion cell layer. They were monostratified in sublamina 5, where the s on bipolar cell outputs are, and they all shared similar branching patterns. Now I'll shift gears a little bit and show you a set of electrophysiology experiments where I was lucky to encounter several IPRGCs. The data shown here is recorded from an ex vivo flat mount preparation of macaque monkey retina. I identified the IPRGCs by their soma appearance, their cone potency, and then most importantly, their very characteristic sustained responses. So the first question we had was about the synaptic origins of the S-off response. This is a voltage clamp recording in response to a temporally modulated full field S-cone isolating stimulus. And it revealed that S-cone signals are present in the inhibitory, but not the excitatory synaptic input to the M1 IPRGC. This increase in inhibition during the S-cone increments is consistent with amacrine cells mediating the S-off response and M1 IPRGCs. Now here's a current clamp recording of an IPRGC's response to a 10 second light. You can see a little bit of a residual transient response from the cone photoreceptors at light onset. And then around four seconds in, the intrinsic response kicks in. Now here's a light that's 20 times as bright. Uh, the x-axis is a little different, but the timing's the same with this very dramatic depolarization, presumably the intrinsic response occurring at about the same time point as before. So the point I wanted to emphasize here is that melanopsin is slow and it's also about a thousand times less sensitive than conopsins. So this together creates an operating range where the cone potency I'm talking about today will be the dominant input to the circadian system. Next, we wanted to look at the spatial arrangement of cone inputs to the M1 IPRGC. This is important because spectral potency allows IPRGCs to encode changes in wavelength. But to do this well, the cone inputs need to be in the right spatial arrangement. Any mismatch in the size or the offset of the LM on and S off subunits will create a neuron that confuses spatial and spectral stimuli and responds well to white light. A single opponent receptive field is shown here, which had been reported for the IPRGCs would be ideal and would respond only to changes in wavelength. So we confirm this by measuring the spatial frequency tuning curve with drifting gratings modulated in S cone contrast or luminance. We observed minimal spatial potency demonstrated here by this roughly low pass spatial tuning curve. If there had been an antagonistic surround, we would expect to see it more band pass. And then you can also see this again in a map of the IPRGC's receptive field obtained from the spike triggered average to binary spatial noise stimulus. There's this on center with very little off surround. So thus the spatial structure of spectral potency in IPRGCs is well suited to encode chromatic circadian cues. So to conclude this section on the M1 IPRGCs, uh, within all mammalian retinas, there's a short wavelength cone exclusive on bipolar cell, homologous to the S on bipolar cell. And this has been uh, proposed to form the basis of the primordial color vision circuit, which compares long and short wavelength cones. Here we show that this S cone to S on bipolar cell pathway extends to the inner retina with an additional S-cone exclusive inner neuron, an amacrine cell that receives only S on bipolar cell input. Now the concept of a primordial color vision circuit has been considered as the precursor to our own primate color perception circuitry. However, our findings suggest instead this ancient color vision circuit could still be serving its original function. Much of the S-cone amacrine cells output is targeted to IPRGCs another highly conserved neuron mediating primordial non-image forming visual functions essential for survival. Because before we needed to perceive or even discriminate blue from yellow, we needed to know the time of day, which is when to go to sleep and when to wake up. 
Accordingly, we propose the S cone amicron cell is part of an evolutionarily ancient circuit, not for hue perception, but for circadian photo entrainment. So that's my first story on uh, the S cone inputs to IPRGCs. And it was a nice one because, you know, we had a hypothesis, we tested it, the results were consistent with the hypothesis and our expectations about how circadian coding of color might be working. The second story on S cone inputs to IPRGCs came kind of completely out of left field for us. We weren't really expecting it and we're still trying to make sense of what it means for vision. So as I was working on the S cone amicron cell project, I reconstructed, as you saw, a lot of S on bipolar cells and a lot of postsynaptic small bistratified ganglion cells. And as you can see, the small bistratified ganglion cells in purple were definitely the dominant ganglion cell output of this S on bipolar cells shown here in blue. However, I would sometimes notice another cell shown here in red that would receive maybe one, maybe two synaptic inputs from the S on bipolar cell. And it would, it would have been pretty easy to miss if I hadn't been reconstructing like 60 plus S on bipolar cells. But I eventually reconstructed these cells. I found two of them. And to my surprise, they looked just like M2IP RGCs. Now I'm showing you the final reconstructions where it's pretty obvious, but as I was reconstructing them, I had a lot of questions. You know, the M2IP RGCs are supposed to be S off, and this would be giving them an S on response. So I didn't really know what to make sense of all the S on bipolar cell input. And I started to kind of think about other hypotheses, like maybe it's just some new weird amicron cell. And this, this was my thinking at the time um, when I had something very lucky happen, actually. Normally I leave this out of the talk, but I thought it's a kind of chronobiology themed, so I thought maybe this group would like it. Um, so I was reading about spectral sensitivity in the, of circadian photo entrainment in the hamster. And this was a nature paper uh, from back when nature had all the articles pushed together on one page. And if I'm being honest to this day, I, uh, I probably still haven't even read this paper because as soon as I looked at it, I saw a figure from another paper at the top. And as soon as I looked at this, I thought, you know, wait, this is, this is an M2IP RGC. And this paper is talking about it receiving S on bipolar cell input. Turns out this was Andrew Mariani's 1984 paper identifying S cone on bipolar cells. It's really a classic paper in our primate retina field, must have read it a dozen, a dozen times, and yet I had no recollection of this figure three, which, but here it is though, showing a wide field ganglion cell receiving S on bipolar cell input. So with this kind of external validation that M2IP RGCs could maybe be S on, uh, I then kind of started to look at this systematically. We ultimately confirmed that these cells were M2IP RGCs based on a wide range of morphological features. First, their overall appearance was consistent with M2IP RGCs, given their very large, sparsely branching dendrites. Second, they stratified adjacent to the ganglion cell layer in the same region as the S on bipolar cell terminals, as reported for both primate and non-primate M2IP RGCs. No other wide field monostratified primate ganglion cell type stratifies in this region. And third, they were never presynaptic, only postsynaptic, which is strong evidence against the possibility that they were amicron cells. And then last, they each had an axon going to the ganglion cell layer, another very strong indicator of being a ganglion cell. And most interestingly, this cell had a, a split axon that divides into two, which to the best of my knowledge has only been reported for IPRGCs. So based on all these criteria, I was then confident that these were in fact M2 IPRGCs. We next systematically investigated their bipolar cell input. We annotated every presynaptic bipolar cell input to the two M2 IPRGCs. Here you see the locations of each bipolar cell synapse, and here you see the associated bipolar cell terminals. The S on bipolar cells are in blue, and then on midget and DB6 in green and orange, respectively. Out of the 149 bipolar cell inputs we analyzed, 96% were for, from S on bipolar cells. And as before, we confirmed each S on bipolar cell by reconstructing the postsynaptic small bistratified ganglion cells, which you see down here in purple. So taken together, this work demonstrated that M2IP RGCs receive a lot of S on bipolar cell input. So what effect does the S on bipolar cell input have? We actually have next to no recordings of S on bipolar cells 
and primate. However, we can infer quite a bit about their circuitry from recordings of their upstream and downstream neurons. That's the S cones and the small by stratified ganglion cells, respectively. So the S cones receive feedback from H2 horizontal cells. These target S cones, but they also contact L and M cones as well. Thus the, and then they feed back on the, uh, S, the S cones, thus creating S versus L plus M cone opponency that's already present at the S cones output. Now recordings of small by stratified ganglion cells confirm that cone opponency is conveyed through the S on bipolar cell to the small by stratified, establishing much of their S on LM off cone opponent responses. So we can expect the S on bipolar cell to provide a similar cone opponency to the M2A PRGC. So we knew that they were getting a lot of S on input, but we wondered whether that strong S on signal could be attenuated somehow by perhaps S off input from S cone amicron cells. To answer this, we also looked at the presynaptic amicron cells and we found only two synapses from S cone amicron cells, one's here and one's there. So this indicates that unlike the M2 IPRGC, or sorry, unlike the M1 IPRGC, the M2 IPRGCs receive very little S cone inhibition. And this means that the M1 and the M2 IPRGCs, they actually have opposite spectral tunings, S off for the M1 IPRGCs and S on for the M2 IPRGCs. So as I mentioned, the S on input to M2 IPRGCs was completely unexpected to us. And it raised the obvious question, of what it means for vision. So the biggest gap in knowledge right now limiting our ability to really place this result into the context of our visual function is the lack of information on M2 IPRGC projections, particularly in primate. We do know some things from mouse though. In mouse, they project to the OPN, which governs the pupillary light reflex. So it's a safe bet to think that they may do the same in primate. And actually speaking of the mouse, David Burson recently gave a talk that's on worldwide neuron where he reports some mouse M2 IPRGCs receive extensive S on bipolar cell input, suggesting this circuit could be conserved. But we also wonder more, more about uh, the M2 IPRGCs projections to the SCN. How much do they project to that region? What other regions do they project to? And do their S on signals ever mix with the M1's S off signals? Or do the two cells do something completely separate? One bit of speculation is that if the outputs of the M1 and the M2 IPRGCs do combine downstream, then what we're seeing here is a very common circuit motif, the splitting of signals into on and off pathways. Having both an S on pathway and an S off pathway would enable S cone input to have a push pull effect rather than just working in a single direction through the M1 IPRGCs S off response. So in short, we don't really have an answer yet to why they have S cone S cone on input to the M2 IPRGCs. And understanding the M2 IPRGCs S cone on responses and how they shape non inventory visual functions will be an exciting direction for future research. That being said, the M2 IPRGC did have some concrete implications in another area, theories of retinal color coding. And I'll wrap up my talk by describing a little bit about that. So first we have to take a step back and discuss a classic and highly influential model of visual processing that forms the foundation of most color vision models. This is called the redundancy reduction hypothesis. And it proposes the purpose of retinal processing is to reduce redundancy to efficiently communicate as much information as possible through the optic nerve. That compressed information would then be unpacked downstream. The retinal imagery built and only then would cortical circuits begin the computations that actually define visual perception and behavior. So from this hypothesis, if the primate retina does its job well, you wouldn't even need to include it in your figures, like this one where the image goes straight to the cortex. Now this hypothesis predicts a compact coding scheme for color, specifically a small number of neurons, each carrying as much independent, non-redundant wavelength information as possible. And from this re redundancy reduction hypothesis, a theory of retinal color coding emerged in which the spectral tunings of the three most common primate ganglion cell types, the parasol, the midget, and the small bistratified, could capture most of the variance in natural scenes. Their cone inputs would be L plus M for the parasols, L minus M for the midgets, S minus L plus M for the small bistratified. And here's what that could look like. 
you get one pathway that sums the cones to reflect intensity, and the other two pathways subtract the cones to cancel out the redundant or shared information and encode only the differences in wavelength. Importantly, this compact code for color requires just one neuron for communicating S cone signals to the brain. And that would be the small by stratified ganglion cell. More than one would be redundant. Yet while reconstructing all these S cone circuits for my PhD, I encountered at least five S cone RGCs. The first four were pre previously reported, and the only purpose for their cone opponency that's been proposed so far is a role in color perception. But if you stop and think about the redundancy or reduction hypothesis, there really isn't room for more than one of these cells. Finding the M2IP RGC was cool because it's kind of a special case where it has the exact same spectral tuning as the small by stratified ganglion cell. So it raises the question of why, having, why have two pathways carrying redundant spectral information? Why not say just uh, sum up the outputs of the small by stratified ganglion cells to get a receptive field like the M2IP RGCs downstream. Importantly, the spectral tuning of these two cells is only redundant if considered independently of the other ganglion cell, of the other response properties. So these two cells, they share spectral tuning, but they differ in other regards. One has a smaller spatial receptive field, the other has a large spatial receptive field. One gets off by polar cell input, the other expresses melanopsin. All these different responses, we typically consider them independently but in practice, they're all operating together. And the simplest interpretation of these differences is that they reflect different roles in vision. This is a common idea in non-primate retinal research, but the idea that, this is the idea that the retina pre-processes visual information, and then the ganglion cells communicate specific visual features to the brain. So what do I mean by that? Well, to make this kind of abstract idea more concrete, we can think back to the M1IP RGCs. These are great cells because they offer a unique opportunity to analyze how we think about the visual information that ganglion cells encode. We can do that because we actually know a little bit about what their function and vision is. So the IPRGCs encode information about intensity, which we might wanna use for say brightness perception. They're also spectrally opponent and they encode changes in wavelength. So that could be used for color perception. And accordingly, there's a lot of research focused on trying to figure out whether our cortex takes advantage of this information for perception. However, knowing the IPRGC's role in circadian photoentrainment, we could also see these as different measures of a single feature, not just the time of day, or more precisely, the location of the sun and the sky. And it does this by encoding the features of the visual scene that change with solar angle. Now, this isn't a new idea, of course. Uh, Manuel even has a whole review article about how different species use cone opponency for this exact purpose. However, when it comes to the primate retina, we've always had this strong tendency to think in terms of perception and information rather than pre-processed features. Our working hypothesis is that the M2IP RGCs could be analyzed in the same, in the same way, and all we're missing is the feature. Perhaps it's the time of day, maybe it has more to do with their role in pupillary light reflex, maybe it's both. The only way we'll know for sure is with the sort of causal behavioral experiments that led to the discovery of the M1IP RGC's role in circadian photoentrainment. So to conclude, we found the M1 and M2IP RGCs have opposing forms of spectral potency. Both are mediated by the S on bipolar cell pathway, which provides direct input to the M2IP RGCs and indirect input to the M1 IPRGCs by a sign inverting S cone amacron cell. In the initial discovery of IPRGCs, they challenged conventional ideas of retinal circuitry by breaking the standard classification between ganglion cells and photoreceptors, which was generally thought to be two distinct cell types. The fact that IPRGCs ended up being conserved across species, including primate, challenged the classic idea that the primate retinal output was somehow unique and distinct from other species due to our expanded cortex. And here the IPRGCs challenged us to think of spectral potency in new ways, or, or at least new ways for the primate retina, expanding beyond color perception to consider more evolutionarily ancient functions for wavelength and non-image forming visual functions. And finally, the cone potency in IPRGCs wasn't consistent with the redundancy reduction hypothesis. And in fact, the inability of this hypothesis to account for the diversity of ganglion cells 
and their correlated responses has driven the development of new hypotheses, and most areas have moved on for redundancy reduction. However, it still forms the basis of the leading primate color vision models, which may need to be critically revisited. Instead, accounting for the IPRGC's you know, redundant spectral tuning may instead require the context of the visual functions that each ganglion cell evolved to mediate. And before I wrap up, I want to highlight a few of the people who helped with the work I presented today. First, Andrea Bort, uh, Julie Chang, and Marcus Mazzaferi helped reconstruct the S on bipolar cells and small bistratified ganglion cells for the M2 IPRGC project. Second, uh, Jim Kuchenbecker has been a great colleague throughout this project, and he's continued this line of investigation with experiments in humans aimed at uncovering the impact of the IPRGC's spectral tuning for circadian photoentrainment. Then with, together with our colleagues, David Marshak and Julie Ogilvy, we've been investigating aspects of the IPRGC circuitry that don't involve codependency. I think some of that's already available as a preprint on Research Square. And then finally, Serial EM requires a lot of microscopy, but also a lot of software. And I wanted to mention that everything we've used is open source, freely available. We use uh, Viking uh, from Brian Jones Lab for annotation and some software I put together for data analysis and visualization. If you ever find yourself doing some serial EM, it's all open source and available online. And so with that, I just wanna finish up by thanking the lab and our funding sources. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Sarah.